This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043. All right, the new album from Extreme is six, and they're playing Bergen Pack uh, January 24th in Englewood. All the info and all the new videos of the band, extreme band.com. Nuno, uh, welcome to the show. Great to speak to you finally. And um, I have a full disclosure to make to you. I actually won a Nuno Betancourt guitar from a radio station here in New York City. It had to be 1990. I wasn't even a DJ then, but I was so in love with the band from day one. I think it was like a maybe like a midnight blue strat type of thing. I don't know what kind of endorsements you had going on back then. But I will never forget that, and that was just fantastic. Um, so yeah, that's way, that's way back in the 1900s. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, uh, 15 years since the last album. We all know this, and it's not like you've been sitting around doing nothing, obviously, you and the other guys. But I'm just wondering, you know, with the hiatuses and the personnel changes uh, you know, that have happened over the years, you know, with with you and Pat and, and Gary, uh as you get older, like we're all older now, do things get easier? And is this why the extreme album is now here or is it something else? Timing, whatever. Yeah. I mean, look, I don't think it's uh I don't think it's specifically um, a timing thing or things get easier. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, with bands, as we get older, I think they get harder, you know, because everybody, everybody grows up and has lives and become, at least, you know, we're all in arrested development, but we like to believe we're adults. And just because we have kids and, and mortgages, we're, we're still we're still 17 in many, many oh, ways. Oh, totally. You know I mean? Which is great. And, uh, and I think that's what keeps us young in the sense of, um, you know, doing shows that we do and tours that we still do. I mean, uh, you know, it's that there's a feeling of arrested development where when you get on stage and you've been playing rock and roll since you were like 14 or 15, it, you you kind of just the switch goes off and there's no way to be older. There's no way to, unless you really don't care about what you're doing. But for us, you kind of black out, you do a two hour show and you're like, and people are like, Oh my God, I saw you, you know, I saw you back in 91, 92 and this show was better. You guys are crazier. What's going on? And we're like, it, it's just like, there's no way to do it halfway for us. And I think that's always been the thing for extreme. I think at least, the live show's always been the same. It's always been passion driven. And it's the same thing that you bring up about the album. <clears throat> it's like, 50, it didn't take 15 years to make the album. It took the same amount of time as it makes, as it takes to make a 12 song album. Meaning that, you know, it's 12 songs. What took 15 years is, is basically, you know, uh, unfortunately we're bad businessmen, especially myself. It would have been much easier and much more uh, financially uh, sound to put out an album every year, to put out an album every two years and do a great tour, cash in on whatever we're doing, you know, and and for us, um, you know, uh, with, with, with us, it's always like, no, you know, I, I don't want to put anything out that doesn't mean something. And and when I say when I say that, I mean, mean something to us selfishly, meaning like we've always seen putting out an album into the world and putting it out in as a privilege, you know, as almost like man, you still, you still have fans out there. You still have, you know, we always believe that, you know, we're not just doing it for the sake of just putting shit out. We're doing it because, you know, we're, we're, we want to be proud of it. We still, we still have our bar was raised by everything that we grew up on, you know, Queen and Van Halen and Zeppelin and, and Aerosmith. And we're like, how can we even look ourselves in the mirror and not believe for ourselves? We are not those bands and nor will we ever be, but how can we not at least be at that level in our world and say like, are you really, is every inch of this album something that you cannot wait to play your friends, your brothers, your fans, DJs, press, where you can sit there and go, regardless if they like it, love it, hate it, that you can still go like, you know what? I don't care what they think because it's it means everything to us. And when you do that, you can put your head on the pillow at night, whether people love it, hate it, that shouldn't decide whether or not it's the greatest solo of the century or not, which should decide on a solo like Rise is like, were you all in and were you passionate when you were playing every solo that is on this album? The rest is for you all to decide. Everybody else decides the reactions don't come from us. The, 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 all the reactions and the love that we got from this album were like almost shocking. You know, like, really? Wow, this is amazing. It's beautiful. It's incredible. And I was like in 14 magazine covers in a month when I hadn't been in one in 30 years, you know? So when that happens, 
that's up to everybody else. But the important thing is, is that we didn't put anything out that we were just like, yeah, it's good. And I'm sure maybe the stuff that we've had, we had 35, 40 songs over the last 15 years. And I'm sure it would have been a decent album if we put those out. But it wasn't for us something like, oh, it wasn't until we were writing some of these like Rise and Rebel and, you know, and, and, and Hurricane. And then we started seeing, wow, this is touching us. And that's what's really important. And it's like any band or any artist that tells you they're doing an album for the fans or for somebody else is either full of shit or I don't want to hear that album. I don't want to hear an album that you do for somebody else. I want to hear you be the most egotistical maniacs that like are so excited about what you're playing and what you're writing and you can't wait for the world to hear it. And after that, it's up to everybody else, you know? Well, it's forever too. You want to put something out and once it's out there, it's forever. You know, it's kind of like a photo yeah, on the it's internet, gonna outlive you us. know? It's, it's going to outlive us. It's going to outlive us. And you want to be when you're gone, when people, you know, hear your albums, you're going to be like, man, this was a cool band or this song was good or this song really affected me in some way, you know? Well, this is a, a great album through and through. We've got the, the expected full-on rockers on the album, also some ballads. And um, I saw your post on Instagram from Christmas Day where, you know, you kind of talk about that. You thank all the extreme fans for just the sort of overwhelming response to this new album, the outpouring of love and support for the new album, the many shows you've done around the world since then. Um did it blow your mind when you got this kind of reaction when, when, you know, first rise came out in, I guess, March or February. And then, you know, the album came out in June. Um, did that blow you guys away? It, it, honest to God, I'm not trying to sound like some, you know, like play the nice guy and be humble and all that. Cause I'm not a humble guy in the sense of like, I know what we do when I, like I just said, we do what we do and we're, we want to take down our idols. You know, we want to be like, let's go after Van Halen. Let's go after that. So we're confident and cocky in that way. But having said that, you know, we're living in a, we're living in an era now, as you know, uh, when you, uh, you know, you want a guitar on the air for God's sakes, right? You're telling me that. And what I mean by that is when we'd release an album back in the day, it took a minute to find out what people thought you'd release it. It'd be reviews maybe. And then it'd be shows. Do people buy tickets? Do they show up? Then it'd be like, Oh, uh, is it in the charts? You'd have to tour the world. It'd take you like nine months to even know, do we got anything here? It's like, any now the way this happens is like, all right, we know today's the day. They're like, what song do you guys want to release? The label might've wanted something else. I'm like, you know what? I just want to do rise. Well, why rise? Well, it's the first song in the album for a reason. And I think, you know, some people were saying it kind of sounds, doesn't sound like extreme. I'm like, exactly. Let's go with an uppercut. Let's go like out of the box, guns blazing and be like, whoa, what is this? And maybe even upset some fans, maybe even like, let's run into the, I've always been about running to the burning building while everybody else is running the other way. And, but the difference is, as you know, is like, okay, okay, guys, uh, you know, you get emails, you get your text from your manager and the label saying, okay, 10 a.m. today, it's going to go live. Whatever, who cares, right? But when 10 a.m. hits, and you're picking up your phone and you're like, how's going on here? It was like 10 minutes, an hour, two hours. In this day and age, you hit that space bar and you hit post, everybody in the world gets it at the same time. And then everybody who hates it will tell you all at the same time how much they hate it. But if they end up like reacting to it and reaction videos and all this stuff, and then you got your peers like, you know, heroes of yours, you know, Steve Luke, that they're hitting you up. You got Brian May sending you an email and you're going like, what's going on? Like, you're excited. I, I think I even shared a few songs with Brian May beforehand, but for whatever reason, when the video comes out and it's three dimensional and everything's happening, you're like, what is going on? It's only been like 24 hours. What do you mean it's a million views? Like, there's no way in hell that we could ever imagine a band at this age. You know, me being 57, Gary in his early 60s, you know, and Pat my age, like, when it, things like that aren't really supposed to happen to bands that already have had some success like we had and then they're doing an album. It's usually like punching the clock and let's go on tour. So yes, it's still a shock. It's still a surprise. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's, it's been so uh, overwhelming, you know, and then the guitar stuff. And I've, I used to think like, you know, reaction videos were kind of silly when it was for other stuff. And then like everybody's sending me links of like, you know, a dad with their son who's a guitar player watching it and watching Rise and the jaws dropping. And I was thinking to myself, man, this is, so beautiful but there's a part of me as a producer as a creator and a writer i had to step back and go like okay i've been kind of doing these solos for like 40 years it's not like can't be that much of a shock and i was like why is this happening now and then i realized that you know i i mentioned it to like steve luke dude and i'm like come on dude really like total guitarist calling it solo of the century come on man 
And, and, and he goes, you know what, Nuno? He goes, we all know you can play. We know the band's pretty decent. It ain't no shock to us. But he said, he said to me something interesting. He goes, the video you guys did and the band, the way the band looked, the way you performed, the way you shot the solo, the fire, the fun, the joy, the r passion, even that you guys even gave a crap about the way you look still these days and you take care of yourself, all that stuff. He goes, what does all that add up to to you? He goes, we've been living in a time where it's fine, he says, because me and him follow a lot of the same, these amazing guitarists that are on Instagram and posting every day. And we're just sitting there like, you know, and I'm like, fuck you, really? Like, that was insane. What the hell? Like, guys that play things that guys like us from that generation don't even understand. No, really it's nuts. You go down a rabbit hole and it's like three hours later. It's like, who are these people it's, like it's, in the other part of the world? These great players. It's like Mateus Asato. It's like Mateus. We call them Mateus the Brazil. We got Mateus in, in Italy and we got like Sylvia in Italy. We got all these guitar players and, and Ricky Graham and all these guys that just blow our minds. But what he said, he goes, that's. That's what's been going on the last 10, 15 years. But he said, when's the last time you weren't just blown away watching somebody sitting on a chair, technically blowing your mind as a guitarist, but instead maybe, can you imagine the, in a rock and roll, in a rock and roll mythology? And I go, wait, he goes, what you guys are doing is bringing back the mythology, the mystery of rock and roll, watching a band again, like we would always go, we were so spoiled by it back in the day of all these amazing guitar players and bands in songs, a solo in a song with harmonies, with a hook, with a band that can perform, with a video that looks badass, with fire and passion. And he's, as he's telling me all this stuff, he's like, when's the last time you or I or Tom Morello or anybody in the guitar world have hit each other up? Okay, they're saying the solo of the century. Okay, let's go back to 2000. When's the last time you hit me up saying, have you heard this guitar solo? Yeah, and I not, was in, like, not in a long time because everyone was doing. I was like, oh, yeah, I, it made me not. He goes, he goes, it just happened to be you. He goes, take that out of the equation. He goes, when's the last time we really? And we're not talking about the guitar players. We're not talking about musicians here. He goes, in a band, something that excited you that you could sing, that there was a hook, that there was harmonies, that was a bridge. There was something where somebody curated and cared enough about music in the sense of putting an album out. Because he goes, that was like, for me, that was the best compliment I was getting. My peers my heroes, fans. When I was looking at comments, I don't read comments. I don't read anything because I'm. every artist is like me. They don't want to admit. They're like, you could be playing for 90,000 people and you could be singing your whole songs. But if there's one guy in the, in the front giving you the finger, you're going to cry and go, why does he hate me? So we don't, I stay away from all that stuff and what people think. But my manager is like, you got to go read the comments. You got to go read, please just read a few, just see what they're saying, see what they're talking about. And one of the reasons he wanted me to read it, he goes, he goes, Nuno goes, what's really interesting is there was a lot of thank yous. It wasn't like, man, you guys are great. Man, I love your band. It was like, thank you for this album. And I was like, well, thank you. And they were going on like, we haven't had an album in a while that we put on in the car and we can drive and listen to it from top to bottom. And Tom Morello was telling me the same thing. Like you play something for a guitar player, you expect them to go like, yeah, dude, I love that soul of that. He's like, man, I love how we listen to this from top to bottom. We kind of didn't stop. And you woke up afterwards, go like, man, we got an album. And he goes, people are so worried about playlisting and the singles and that one song and the and the views and the TikToks of it all that sometimes the artistry of just putting an album together. And I'm not bragging about extreme. I'm just saying the art of it in general. We don't know how to do it any other way. So we weren't expecting it because it's just what you do. It's like an old, old dog doing what they're doing and not saying, hey, let's do what everybody's doing now. Because even for me as a guitar player, you don't think that the social media department that we're working with said, you know, hey, the day before the song comes out, can you sit in your little studio and just play the solo to rise and give them a playthrough so you can like, you know, it's just for content and do whatever it is. And I said, no, like, what do you mean? No, it's going to help. I said, no, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt because it's just going to be another, the solo is solo because of the band. It's because of the vibe. It's in the song. It's out of the song. It's what where it takes you. It's what makes you soar. It's you feed off your band members and your chemistry. And they were looking at me like, no, nah, man, it's content. It's content. It's content. I'm like, I disagree. I believe that if I just sat there and I went, and I just played it with no music, it would have been like, it's Nuno playing guitar. Well, that's the thing. Decent riffs. But when it's in a song, it's way more powerful. When I first heard, you know, when everybody started leaking those, um, 
those isolated tracks. Oh yeah, you hear the albums. bass. Those, those, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when I started hearing Edward stuff by itself, like even the beat it solo, wow, I finally get to hear the beat it solo, the iconic beat it solo by itself. I was listening to it and I was like, oh, it, it, it was what I thought it was, but it was almost so revealing and so just guitar that it wasn't as magical because you weren't hearing da, 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 da. That's what makes that the pumping and everything that's going on. People don't realize that Isolated tracks is like going through somebody's underwear drawer. You're not supposed to do it. It's private. Why? Because I played to my rhythm section. My rhythm section is so important to this solo. And guitar players need to revisit that, that you're just a power of one when you play by yourself. I mean, when you've got a band with chemistry and songs and arrangements and harmony, man, when that solo kicks in, it makes you, it takes you from here to hear really what you're actually doing. It elevates you as a guitar player. That's why to me, the greats are Jimmy Page and Brian May and Hendrix and and uh, Eddie Van Halen because they're in bands that elevate them to a place that is so iconic that when you pull that away, they're kind of like, uh-oh. It's like a house that they all built, you know, drums, foundation, uh, bass players, the, f the framing of the wall, you know, the guitar player comes in and puts all this stuff in the walls and, you know, like he's, he builds that, that that interior. Singers like the roof and the color of the house. When you start pulling those, you, you take that you take that uh, that foundation away, and that frame, guess what happens to the guitar solo? Goodbye, vocals, goodbye, it all collapses. It's really important people to know that chemistry of bands, you know, Bonham, Neil Peart, Rush, you take those pieces away, Stuart Copeland, you take those pieces away, good luck. Oh I'll yeah, give a totally. Shit how good to oh, that's a that's the amazing thing about songs like you know three minutes, four minutes long. It's a complete escape, and it's a journey. And if you take pieces out of it, it's not the same experience at all. Yeah, and good song. You just mentioned a great, you just made the greatest point. Think about in rock and roll, in pop, since before you and I were even born, it was always the same arrangement. It's been the same. It's a verse. It's a chorus. It's a verse. It's a chorus. Maybe a bridge. If the if there's an actual player, a solo, middle eight, we yeah. go out in the chorus, middle eight, and then we're like three and a half minutes to four and a half minutes tops. It's been the same since the beginning of time, but why is it so simple, but yet so it can change your life? That three and a half minutes, four and a half. Why? Oh, change because your mood in a artists, second. You know, there's a soundtrack to your lives. You're willing to go see the band based on a three and a half, four minutes song that touches. Is why? Because the difference is there are layers. It's simple. And then if the band is musicianship, lyrics, melody, those are the complexities of it. And the word I made up was simplexity. When you get that right in those four and a half minutes, you can listen to a song like four or five times and discover something new. And like a three and a half, four and a half minute song, and you keep going, wow, this is hitting me different today. Wow, listen to that harmony. Listen to the way the drum, listen to that hi-hat pattern for God's sakes. It all, that's the true art form of rock and roll is what can this band do at ACDC? who as musicians, everybody's gonna go, really, come on guys, really, down, da 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 boom. When I saw ACDC in an arena in Providence Civic Center, it occurred to me as a young dude that I'm like, oh my God, it's not the fact that he's playing three or four chords in the whole song, it's the spaces they're leaving. Oh, completely. They're an arena rock. The spaces are massive. It's the power within the spaces and the power within that like, the pump of it all and the drum and Phil Rudd is not Neil Peart, but Neil Peart could probably not play that pocket like Phil Rudd does. Charlie Watts, That's the beauty. It's, it's space, you know, it's swing, it's you know, it's the swing. That that DNA and that thing, that people and musicians are so busy putting up like, you know, Olymp Olympic cards and going, that's an eight out of 10 or 10 out of 10 in performance. It's not about that. You put, you you can ask, I guarantee you, you know, God, God bless him, he's gone, but you could ask, you could ask, you know, Neil Peart, you know, the art of a Phil Rudd drummer or Stuper Copeland He's like, are you kidding me? It's like, I couldn't do that in a lifetime. Just go boom, 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 boom. Make it pump like that. Make it feel like that. Because Neil wasn't that. He could play the part. I always get into trouble when I say these things. No, 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 I'm no. But saying, no, he would agree with people you. People think you know? I'm saying, like when I said about Slash playing Rihanna stuff, people think I'm saying that Slash couldn't play what I played in Rihanna. No, people think I'm saying right now that Neil Peart couldn't play an ACDC song. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you ask the true artist or even ask a Slash or you ask a Neil Peart about a simpler player, 
I can't make, I can play if I can play an Angus Young solo. I can learn it verbatim. But you think I can make it feel like that? And <laughs> make it squeak like that and make it like as raunchy as his personality? Not in my lifetime. And well, people get upset at saying these things as if I'm putting somebody no, down. No, no, no. What I'm saying is the art is within the art, is within <clears throat> the simplicity, the complexity of it all. Period. And and the thing is this Neil Peart was the best drummer for Rush. Keith Moon was the Thank best you. drummer for The Who, Charlie Thank Watch you. Stones, Ringo's Beatles. Take them away from and put them in other things. It'll be good, but it's it'll be not good. I be try that. to tell people. I try. To, I try to tell people right now, and they might get upset with this story. I was at as a young kid. I went to the first Nam show I went to, and I walked in, and, and it was Steve Lukather there inviting me. You got to come see this. It's like it's going to be like a country, you know, fusion chicken pig. They were like the Dregs with Steve Morris Ooh, and then yeah. Alvin Lee. These guys that play that play was like four of them. Four of the best of that doing stuff that I was like, oh my God. And I was sitting on the ground next to Steve like a little child. But they told me that Edward was going to be there. He's going to join him. Like, oh my God, Edward's going to be there. Holy shit, my head explodes. Can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. I hate to tell you that I felt bad for Edward in that space. Why? Because he felt like a fish that was out of water without oxygen. Why? Of course, what he played was Edward and it was great, but it sounded going after four of those guys in their domain and their culture and their world. It's like, would be like asking Edward to rap if he never did hip hop. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, and he's doing his thing and it was fun to hear Edward in that realm. That was fun. But really the guitar players next to me in the crowd were going, Jesus. Wow. It's, it's, I, I, I it, it's different. It's different. I felt for Edward a little bit because the pocket of the drummer and everything that was going on was like country chicken picking mental craziness. Now, you put one of those, put Alvin Lee in Van Halen and good night to Alvin Lee. Yeah, totally. There's yeah. no way he's going to, there's no way he's going to play what Edward does. That's the beauty of what I keep trying to say and get my fucking ass into trouble with is that anybody can play anybody else's shit. But like you just said, Edward is the best Edward. Joe Satriani recently, people going crazy about that he couldn't really play. Uh, the oh, yeah, of I saw that. Stuff. Yeah, I saw that. But what I tried to tell people is that, let me tell you something. The fact that Joe even did it, tip the hat, brother. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't know that I would do that because it's so specific. It's a percussive. It's so Edward. You got to be, Edward was a drummer. It's Joe Satriani is the greatest Joe Satriani of all motherfucking time. You put on Surfing with the Alien, it's a masterpiece. What he does is Joe, my God, even next to Vi or any of us or whatever, it's like, damn, Joe being Joe is no other Joe. That's the beauty of what I keep trying to explain to people. Instead, everybody keeps trying to have Olympics. Like, you know, saying that Edward can't do a no, Edward it's can, not Joe that. can't. Do yeah, Joe. it's totally not that. I mean, I totally get it. Uh, Nuno Betancourt is with us. A new album from Extreme is six. They're playing Bergen Pack January twenty fourth. And get all the info, all the new videos of the band at extreme band dot com. I want to talk about that solo really quick in the song Rise, which is the first single. When you let me ask you, like, when it was time, you're in the studio and you're like, okay, we got to cut the solo now. Uh, I don't know if you did it live with the band or whatever, but did you have elements and pieces of that already in mind for that? Or did you just stream of conscious go for it when, you know, your engineer hit record? B, are you good? Leaving the room, somebody coming in out to actually take care of me because it takes me out of my, of that world that I want to be in, which is just like, I want to get lost in it. And for me, yeah, you stand up, the rhythm section, it's it's like, you know, we, we, we don't record, we haven't recorded in the live room in a while because we all live in different parts of the world. So Kevin will fly in, we'll cut the drums, then Gary will fly in and we'll do it like that. But when it's time to do my guitars and I stand up, it's like I put on that solo section and I just go. And I go and I let that dictate me. That rice solo is the perfect example. You got a song that's like, you know, the solo starts with like the band, there's two grooves in that song. One is like double time. The other one is half time. So I'm like, okay, I want to put them both in there. I want, I want to feel what this feels like in the song. What can the song, where can the song take me? And of course, when you start doing it and there's that break, bamba, which is, you know, the greatest Zeppelin break of all time where you, they allow to say like, okay, dude, go. You know what I mean? Where the band gives you that hole to set the, you know, like, like, you know, uh, uh, like you know the, the the greatest Jimmy Page break of all time, you kind of you go and you and you don't know where you're going, and then all of a sudden you find they're going like 
you know, everybody that's in your wheelhouse from, like I mentioned, the, the four Mount Rushmore guys from Brian May to, 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 to Edward Van Halen, to Jimmy Page, you know, and, 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 and Randy Rhodes and those guys, like, you're not sitting there going, I want to do a bit of a little Eddie here, and then I want to do a little bit of a Randy. You're really now who you become, and you're not thinking anymore, which is the beauty of it. Of course, you're going to hear the influences in there. Of course, you're going to hear an Ed, Ed Van Halen-esque dive bomb. Maybe it'll come out. Of course, you're going to hear, but then you're going to hear a percussive thing where people are going to go, oh, shit, that might be just Nuno being Nuno, maybe. Maybe that's what, you know, a bunch of people, I didn't know, a bunch of people said, no, that's Nuno shit right there. He's muted shit. That's what he's been doing. for. That's like that's like his tapping to Edward. I never looked at it that way, but then when people started saying, I'm like, oh my God, I never saw that. So hopefully at one point, you play your personality and whatever's in that utility belt that you've grown up with, Aerosmith, all the bands, all the vibes, melodies, bending a note. You know, when you bend a note, you, you for me, it's like, oh man, Neil Sean was my bender. He was the bender for me. He was like, man, when this guy would bend a note and he would play those melodies, I'm not doing that on purpose, but it, there it is. So the idea is, is like, you go in, you play it, you play back and you go like, what what did I just do? <laughs> you black out to a point like, <laughs> and then you go like, oh man, I like that. I love that. And to me, the closest way to playing live is like to not really create it, but like do a few passes where you're live and you're all in and you just fucking like want to go and go for blood and take your heroes down. And then you listen to those three and maybe you comp them. Maybe you go, I love this section here. And I'll grab that. That's as far as the non live part goes. But in this case of Rise, Something really strange did go down while I was recording Rhymes. That was like, uh-oh, this is very strange. I was cutting the solo. Gary was in town to do his last couple of vocals, specifically on Rise. So today was Rise Day. You know, like, I'm, I told Gary, you know not to come into my studio. I'm at my house. He goes, I'm going to go grab lunch anyway. So what, when we back about 2, 3 o'clock? Yeah, give me like 2, 3 hours with this solo. Let me just, like, let me go for it. He knows not to come in the room. They know for... 30 years don't come in the room and you'll throw shit at me. <laughs> so all of a sudden my phone is sitting there and it's just vibrating like crazy. And I'm like, who's bugging me? Who's bugging me? So I go to like even take it off, whatever. And then now ringing me and I see it's Gary. I'm like, dude, I'm, I literally just did two or three passes of this rice solo, which is basically what you hear now is the solo. And I'm hearing it and I'm doing it. And he's like, and I'm like, I finally call him like, yo, man. You know, I'm in the middle of this. What are you doing, buddy? He goes, you got to come downstairs right now. Like, because my studio is Hollywood Hills. Like, everything's built like this. And it takes three years to go up to the top where my studio is and to go back down. So I'm like, really? He goes, no, you got to come down now. And I thought something happened. I thought he was in an accident. I thought mm. something, my house was on fire. I don't know. For him to bug me for the first time in 40 damn years to come in the middle of a solo interrupt me, I'm like, this better be good. And I thought something happened. I race down the stairs. I come out my door, I open the door. And there's Edward. What? Yeah. And I'm like, that's a good reason. <laughs> that's a good reason to interrupt my solo. But what was really weird about this was what I had just played in my mind that I was just listening to before he gave me a chance to really go in in depth. As I said to myself before he called me, he's like, man, you know what? This, this, this tremolo picking thing that I'm doing feels very eruption-esque to me. You know, feels very eruption. But the only thing was like Ed, Edward always had one thing that we all had to stop using, that we knew no matter what we did, it would make us sound too much like him. And that was his phase 90. So if we any of us put a phase 90 in any solo, people are going to be like, all right, dude, we already know you're influenced by him, but really, you're now going to take his DNA, like his, you're going to wear his clothes, essentially. A phase 90 became Edwards and only Edwards. And if you dare to use it, you better know that that's going to sound like Edward. Yeah. So I never used one. I never bothered really to use one. Went down. He was like, hey, what's going on? You know, with Edward, it's always, it's always a big, big loving kiss on the lips. The smile, like, I mean, you know, I, I see the smile, and, yeah. And, and, and then, you know, we're talking to him and Gary, Gary went to lunch. He didn't tell me who he went to lunch with. And so now Edward's in a great mood, you know, always wondering what he was up to. And he's playing, you know, he's talking about Wolfie's, Wolfie's new, uh, new uh, album that he's doing and how excited and proud he is. And he's playing all the instruments. And he's playing stuff out the window of his car and we listen to it. And then I, you know, he says, so you're doing a new album. I'm like, yeah, you guys are up to doing a new album. I'm like, yeah, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're working on it. And he go, I go, so what are you guys up to? And he goes, goes, well, you know, between us, you know, you know, as this says between us, but like, we're, we're going to go out the way we came. You know, he's telling us that he's Wolfie's reaching out to, to, to Michael Anthony. We're going to, get the original cast back together and do a, a tour and I'm like, 
incredible. Mm. Kind of like a farewell tour of the original guys that everybody's been wanting to see for so long, right? And uh, and then we were like, you're like, wow, this is incredible news. Really, really up and really great mood. And then he goes, so what, what do you got going on up there? And I'm like, oh man, it's not really, he goes, cause he was like, come up and listen to some stuff. And the idiot producer perfectionist Virgo in me is like, listen, it's almost there. You know, like maybe like when, when we get it, like, you know, get all the solos in and everything done, we come up with Koiko. He goes, okay, okay, I'll come back. I'll come back. Of course, it never came to fruition because he passed away. Oh boy. And which was really brutal. And really like, I was just like, wow. I don't know if that was just like an angel coming to visit me before he, you know, my, my true, true, true hero at the top of Mount Rushmore coming to say like, Hey kid, you know, go get him kind of thing. You know what I mean? Do your thing. And wanted to hit something because he seemed healthy and we didn't know what was going on. And, um, and then, you know, all I can ask for, it's like, the first thing I did once I heard the news, even though we were about to go out and the album was done, is I went back in and uh, I ran that solo, that rise solo, I ran it through a phase 90. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and a lot of people say, no, you did that as a tribute to Eddie, the solo. I said, no, the solo was there. Tribute to I am a tribute to Eddie. I'm a walking, I mean, as players, anybody that played guitar after 1978 is a, is a walking tribute to Eddie. We have no choice. Right. But I really wanted to just add that little tone to it and kind of like a thank you. And it's really interesting because he shows up at the house the day I'm doing it. I do this phase 90 thing. And then if that wasn't enough just for myself and for guitar players to hear, hey, here's Nuno like doing whatever, the solo blows up in a way that's like, wait, what is happening? Like, you know, to the point where it's like, wait, I haven't been in a cover of a magazine in like 30 years and now I'm on the cover of like nine or two. Like, what is going on here? You know, what is going on? Why am I getting hit up by like some heroes of mine and peers of mine talking about this solo? And 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 then, and then you know, a magazine that didn't want to put me on the cover. The only one that didn't want to put me on the cover was Total Guitar out of the UK. And they were like, yeah, we got somebody else, whatever. And then I did the interview. And then like two weeks later, my manager calls me and goes, hey, they changed their mind. They're going to put you on the cover. And not only that, you know, they're calling it the solo of the century. I'm like, what? Wow. I'm sitting there like, I'm sitting there within like a month going, okay, what is really going on here? You know, and I say this, I know I can play guitar. I know I've done decent solos. I can do a decent solo for the last 30, 40 years. I've been doing it. And I know the band is decent and all that. But what is really going on? And it really occurred to me that like, you know, even after Eddie passed, I think it, everybody went like, oh shit. Like this is an end of an era. You know, this is an end of an era of a guy who changed guitar playing as we know it, who who influenced a whole, anybody after him. And, and definitely whether they ever admitted it or not, all the guys before him, Paige, uh, you know, uh, Brian, Brian had, had said it. They were all, when they heard that first album, <laughs> when Running With The Devil started, and then we got to Eruption, they all quietly went like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> totally. And, and so I think what happened, you know, I was, I was talking to Steve Lukather about it, and I was like, dude, he goes, he goes, he goes, you got to understand, and he goes, he goes, we've, we all grew up together, kind of in those generations. We were spoiled by a lot of great guitar players and a lot of great bands and guitar players and bands. That was our era, but it hasn't been that way in a while. Yes, are they great guitar players everywhere? Of course they are. They're sitting in chairs and they're playing like we talked about earlier. And they're, they're game changers even in the guitar world. But he said, the difference is crossing over into the mainstream, into where people are listening, listening to music and songwriting and all lyrics and all that. When you were a guitar player in that element, people like all of a sudden go like, whoa, what's going on here? In the sense like he goes, it's the mythology of rock and roll. Like where has that been? He goes, when's the last time we talked about a guitar player in a band that is, is kind of like, in this case, set the internet on fire, whatever he goes. And I'm not even talking about myself. He says, I'm talking about it. He said, anybody. And I was like, but it was just a guitar. So he goes, well, that's the beauty of it. It's supposed to happen that way. He goes, he goes, and I'm glad it's you, buddy. He goes, I'm glad it's you because I've, I've always, you know, thought that you were always, you know, kind of, you know, a little bit in the shadows of, of guitar players and stuff like that when it came to that stuff. And it's about time. And he goes, he goes, but he goes, I have to agree with them. He goes, I'm not telling you this is my friend. I'm have to agree with it. It's like you put an album together and you went for blood and maybe it was, you know, it's a combination too. You know, I have to give, I have to give props to Generation X. 
I'm on stage with heroes of mine. I'm on stage with Steve Vai, Zach Wilde next to me. I got Ingve on the other side. These are guys that I admire. And these are guys that were kicking my ass and making me remember. Like, hey, you got, you got a responsibility here, bro. If you want it, like you got to step up to the plate. And they kicked my ass. So I think a combination of that, those guys touring with them three or four times, Edward, all of it was just like this moment of like, you know, I don't know. My manager was like, what do you want to do with this album with Guitar Wise? And I, I was like, what do I want to do with it? It was like, I, I guess for me right now, it's just like, man, I want to bring the joy back into it and the fire back into it and the creativity where Edward brought, get, brought back into it, where it wasn't just a solo, it was in the rhythm playing. It was, you know, the melodies of the Brian The May, song like structure, heroes. the production, everything. It's not just Eddie's guitar, it's the whole thing. And to yeah. put those melodic solos at the right places in all those great songs... I mean, yeah. and it makes you realize everything that you're saying is that like you and I both very lucky to be alive walking on the planet when these guys have been alive and are still alive, you know? That was like every day was a solo that was blowing our minds or a song in the solo or, so, or an album. You're like, have you heard the album? It was like, we were so spoiled be, through the 70s and 80s and even 90s. And, not, and, and so everybody was like, yeah, that's great, Nuna, but really since 2000, of course it's great. And listen, let's get something straight. There's some great newer, younger metal bands, like new metal that everybody refers to, like, you know, Five Figure Death Punching with, with, with Andy James on guitar. Like, there's some still some great albums, and people are still making great albums. Don't get me wrong. What I'm referring to is I'm going way back. I'm going to, like, I'm, I'm, I'm aging myself by saying of our generation of that style or, or straight up, you know, straight up rock and roll. Basically, where we all played in a blues pentatonic way, which we had to get creative in a really four on the floor, not like, you know, you know, like Tosin Abbasi was with us with this new generation. These guys are playing shit that's so out of the box that they can go out of the box. Not only the songs are out of the box, but the rhythm's out of the box, everything. We're talking about what can you, that generation of what can you do as a guitarist in the simplest form of just a verse and a chorus and a couple of open chords and, and just some riffs and still maybe turn some heads and still within like, you, it's like, here, cut this off, cut this off. Make us, make us get creative. I dare you. I dare you to stay creative within that box of that pentatonic blues world where the Angus Youngs and everybody lived that we grew up in and the Hendrix is the world that said, oh yeah, check this shit out. <laughs> and, Nuno Vettencourt is with us and uh, the new album from Extreme is six. They're playing Bergen Pack January 24th. All the info, all the new videos of the band you can watch right now, extreme-band.com. Uh, Nuno, do you have hoop skills that I'm not aware of on the basketball court? Because I play hoops, and I know you had a little problem earlier in 2023. But are you are you a basketball guy? Do you like do you play when tell whenever you, you can? Let me tell you something, brother. When 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 we when we were starting out, first of all, I'm the biggest jock in the world. I played hockey, played basketball, baseball, football, all of it. That, that I was that would have been the only reason I did do music because I really believed I wanted to play football or soccer rather for Portugal at one point, my 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 motherland. But, you know, I had 1920 blew up my ACL on my left knee. If you ever look at any extreme tours from pornography onward, you'll see a massive, you know, like robo fucking cop, you know, a brace that I had on my left leg. But it was because me and Gary, all we did every day when we were writing those first albums or whatever, we'd write, but then we'd go out down the street and we'd look, pick up games, hoop, 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 hoop all day, all the time. We'd drive to different places in Boston to play pickup games. We were obsessed with playing basketball. So you're a Celtics obsessed. fan? Oh, absolutely. Okay, all right. 1,000. And, but in this case, I haven't, I don't play as much anymore and I haven't played as much anymore. And we're on this damn cruise and then Gary's like, they always have like a, you know, a, 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 the, the, they have a game there, celebrity match, and I've played it before, but I'm like, we got dates coming up and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, I don't think we should do it. So we both pulled out of it. Next thing you know, Mr. Sharon is like telling me, come on, let's go. Let's just play for 10 minutes. You know, he's all, <laughs> he's all ready to go. I'm walking out the door dressed. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, and he knows that's our kryptonite. You can't just threaten me with that and you're going to go play and I'm not coming it's with so you. It's so fun. It's so fun and it's not as boring as running and you're getting a nice workout. Play for me to go up took one play for me to go out after we played for a quarter, go out and block a shot and think I'm fucking Dennis Rodman or whatever. And then I came down wrong, avoiding, avoiding somebody's foot. And you know what that happens when that happens? My knee went boom, boom. I saw it come out and come in and I tore MCL. I tore the, the, the ACL is gone completely full ACL gone. It's still gone. Wow. 
So, but you're okay yeah. now. You're just not going to just jump. Well, you're not going to run around on I'm stage. I'm okay or? in the sense where I need to have an ACL. My MCL was, uh, you know, gone. I, I tore my meniscus. You know, it was what they call the, what they call the try something of. Oh, like I did the meniscus during the pandemic. I did that too. And it's just, you know, I didn't do yeah. surgery. So I, I, did, I, I yeah. did the meniscus enough to tour and I'm wearing a, an ACL brace to, to allow to do all the shows because I would have had to cancel eight months of tour dates and the album had just come out and I didn't want the fans to be like, great, you guys, we wait 15 years for your album. Now you go and yeah. you do that and you cancel all your dates. So I didn't really want to disappoint the momentum of what we had. And then the, the day and, and, and the fans would be like, you know what? Fuck you guys like enough. Like you guys come around then you go and play basketball and then the whole year is gone. So I really wanted to hang in there and it's been great. I, the brace has been great. I had surgery. My, my guy is works on the Lakers as well out in LA. He was, you know, uh, Dr. McAllister, you always got it. You always got to shout him out, man. Guys. Shout him out. I gave you Dr. David McAllister, and, and, he, and he, he's the best in LA. He works at UCLA, and he got me up and running, man, and got me on tour. Uh, you mentioned Portugal, your homeland. Uh, is it me, or is it I? Everybody that I follow, or stuff that I see on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, Portugal has become such a destination for people like the last two or three years do you notice yeah, that as i wish well? they'd stop i wish they'd stop invading the motherland right yeah no, apparently a lot of people from california splitting this big exodus going to the mainland it's one of the safest i think if not the second most safest place on the planet to live apparently after iceland or something like that and it's also the food's amazing the wine's amazing the people are beautiful it's look i'm from the azores not the mainland just right outside, yeah but i am I'm from Portugal because the Azores are part of Portugal, but the Azores is a whole other spectacular. I think it's one of the most beautiful places on this planet. If you ever get a chance to go, there's nine islands there. It's, I call it my motherland because, you know, I don't want to sound in, in respect to everybody that lives in Portugal, even though I was born there. I never like to be pretentious and say like, you know, like I'm, I'm Portuguese, but I'm also American. I grew up American. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a Portuguese son, but I'm very American as well. I'm an immigrant. And I'm very proud of this country in America as well, as you can see. And uh, I think it's one of the greatest countries in the world, regardless of that it's not very popular to say that these days. But uh, but uh, I, I feel like, you know, um, it's 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 I would have never had the opportunities that I have in talking to you right now if I never if we never moved to this country. So, yeah. well, I'm going to hit you or your manager up when I go to Portugal because it looks insane. Absolutely, brother. I mean, it looks amazing. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit. I want to talk to you really quick about uh, Robert Palmer, who I think is one of the most underrated singers uh, of all time. Okay, let's do it. Robert Palmer. Tell me about Robert Palmer, Robert man. Palmer. Well, Robert Palmer, man, obviously we've all admired Robert Palmer, like, everything he's done through the years and, and even at the height of his solo career, you know, career and everything doing not only, not only from power station, but what he was doing just with everything on his own. And I remember it was after the porn graffiti tour. And it's one of those things when you have a successful album, like porn graffiti, you never get off the road. You don't know that you can until you're older, but your manager's like, yeah, keep going. You got to keep going. And you know, a year and a half straight and you're like, do I have any friends left? Do I have any family <laughs> that I miss you? I missed funerals. I missed birthdays. I missed weddings. Um, but you were twenty you something. Home? You were twenty something too. It was different, you know. Of course, of course. That's all you wanted to do. Yeah. You were living the dream, right? Yeah. But then when you got home, you were you were beat. You were like, okay, we did like every continent like three times already. I think we need to like just stop for a second. But then you get home, and I'm telling you, I'm not even joking. I think it was the day I walked in the door, I shut the door, go upstairs. My man was just like, okay. I know you don't want to hear this right now, but Robert Palmer called and he wants to know if you would play on the whole album with him, his, his, his solo album. I'm like, and of course I'm like, hell yeah. But of course I'm like, hell no. Like, and, and I'm like, when? He goes like, leave to Italy tomorrow, to <laughs> Milan. And I'm, like, and I'm just like, oh my Lord. I'm just like, really? Tomorrow? He goes, yeah, he's doing the album now. And he's super excited about you doing the guitars. And he's the, the guy that, you know, he wanted you specifically. And I'm like, and I swear to God, I've never done anything for money. On, you know, because, and I should be. We talked about this earlier. And I was just like, I didn't want to say no. I wanted to do it so bad, but I really felt really broken. Not only, not only physically, but even like mentally. I was like, I don't know if I can do it. Can you ask him, can I go like in two weeks and I have like one week at home? Can I just like sleep in a bed? Can I not living and living out of a suitcase is crazy. Yeah. It's I crazy. Mean, it's like, it's, it's all glamorous, but it's crazy. 
and, and and I just I wanted to just take out the trash for a fucking day. Imagine that. I wanted to be like human and mow the lawn or do something like do laundry do and that, wash your blue jeans in your own washing machine. You know what I mean? Like go to my go to my local Papa Gino's pizzeria spot with my closest friend just to catch up just for a minute. Like, can I just do that? Because you got to remember, this is when I say back in the 1900s. I say a lot, but this is like no cell phones yet. Oh yeah, no face. No, not, not, no Skype, nothing that was happening. So when we were away, we were gone. We missed life, period. And, and um, so I'm like, yeah, they said they can't move and he called back. I'm like, okay, I don't want to say no to Robert Palmer. Who the hell would say no to Robert Palmer? So can you just ask, like, what do they want to pay me? Because they pay like guys like me per track because I'm just playing guitars, right? I'm not in the band. So like, what's a fee for you to play per song? And whatever that fee was, I was like, can you ask for like double so they just tell me to go myself? <laughs> like, so that way they make the choice that I'm, I, they don't get me. I don't want to turn them down. Like, can you be my manager and be, be the bad cop? It's like, no, you know what? Before we even talk to Nuno, this is what it is per track because Extreme has got more than words and all that stuff. I'm like, can you do that guy that I never want you to be for me ever? Yeah, just bad, so bad I can cop. Yeah. So he asked for something stupid money for like per track, right? And then. He calls me back five minutes later. I'm like, so yeah, so it's off. He goes, no, they said yes. I'm like, <laughs> like are you kidding me? So now I got to go and do it because I said yes. Oh my God. I'm like, okay, you know, this is, you know, this is Robert Palmer. Get your, get your act together. Suck it up. It's only for two weeks. Get a go good night of sleep. And, yeah. Get a good night of sleep. Get back on the plane. Go back to the airport and fly back to Europe where you just came from. But first... I'm said, so now I got to do it. He goes, no, not yet. I go, wait, I thought you said he wanted me. He goes, no, he wants to talk to you first. Ooh. I'm like, wait, and Robert's going to be calling you. I'm talking on the curly, the curly line, you know. Landline, you know? yeah. Landline. Robert is going to be calling you. He wants to talk to you. I'm like, okay, cool. And this is what I hear. Because I was about to say no even to the money that they ask. I was literally thinking about saying like, I'm sorry, just tell him I'm hurt. I don't know. I, I'm sick. I'm sick. Tell him something. I'm about to say go to Sikra. And he goes, just talk to him. Just talk to him. See, see, see if you vibe. And I'm like, this is what I hear. I pick up the phone and I hear, hello? I go, I go, hello? And I hear nothing for like 10 seconds. And I say, hello? And then I hear this. I'm going to try to, and then I hear, here, I hear. <sighs> New now. It took 20 seconds for him to take a puff it. And I'm like, this is the coolest mother on the planet. You know he's sitting there on the other side of the phone in a full three-piece suit. Oh, completely. He's in oh, with the hottest girl in the world in Italy. And he's just sitting there like the most suave, hair slicked back guy in the world. And he's smoking a cigarette. And he's, I'm talking to Robert Palmer right out of the video. There's no doubt. <laughs> and, and I knew... That the second he took the puff of that cigarette and he said my name with that, the sexiest accent that a guy could ever James Bond of all time, I was in. I was in. It was over. I want to go hang with this guy in Milan and have a ball doing two weeks. And I said, and he's like, I wanted to find out. Pause. Whew, puff of cigarette. If you were interested in maybe coming out to Milan and having this. It was like the coolest, it was like the coolest way to talk to anybody. I was like, this guy's a rock star. He's a legend. I'm out. I'm in. Let's do it. Let's go. And I went out and did, did the full album. Uh -huh. And by the way, I was right. I was right. Everybody thinks like, oh yeah, he's on a video and he's got, you know, addicted to love and he's got the suit and he's got all the hot chicks around him. And everybody thought, yeah, that's, that's a video. That's video, Roger Palmer. Uh -uh -uh. That's Robert Palmer at the airport. That's Robert Palmer waking up, waking my ass up for breakfast and going to have a coffee, he's in his suit, he lives, he's James Bond of rock and roll, period. And it was quite the experience after, and every night we'd finish at a certain time because we had to go to a restaurant, then Milan, then we'd get in a car with his driver and he'd drive us and we'd go into an alley and we'd go through a curtain and we'd go underground and we'd have the best Italian food being made by some mom, some mother in the back of the restaurant. I don't know what was going on, but this guy was the best hang of all time. Oh, Swab. Man. So great. Maybe. Nuno Betancourt is with us uh, from Extreme. Their new album is Six, and they're playing Bergen Pack in Englewood January 24th. All the info, all the videos of the new videos of the band, extreme-band.com. Um, last one, Paul McCartney. You, I believe, have a Paul McCartney story. 
Well, I mean, look, Paul McCartney, <laughs> the Paul McCartney is, is a story, but it's, 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 it's not even a story. It's a, it's a, it's an event. You know, it's an event in my life. It's Paul McCartney. I mean, so is, listen, I've been really blessed. I, I'm sitting here like, I feel like I got to lean down and pick up names. Thankfully, you're asking me about these names. But but I feel like as I'm telling you, I, I realize out loud how blessed my life has been being this kid from Hudson, Massachusetts, an immigrant from Portugal who was sitting in a bedroom in a four family place with roaches and and and, and most of the time, not even in the dark, not even able to have electricity to, to, to play. That's how, you know, we're youngest of 10 kids, you know, it's 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 the real true american immigrant story where you know you don't you know you just sit there and all you got is your guitar and you sit there and you play for 16 18 hours a day and you and you make you tell yourself that you're gonna go and you're gonna do it and you fucking you're all in and you go and and then you but then when you start doing these amazing interviews with like yourself you start out loud going wait did he just say paul mccartney did he just say robert palmer you know and and it's you know steven tyler nobel peace prize all these things and i just sit here and go like you know rihanna all of this stuff and playing super bowl and i i sit there and go man i've had such a blessed i mean i've listened i work hard you know i i, I don't stop i work hard but but uh, I, I put everything i have into everything i do it, all the time i've never I, I don't think i've ever taken a vacation a proper vacation in my entire life meaning i paid to go somewhere and just hang out i think it's always been i'm working there let's have a vacation i'm working here let's have right a yeah yeah a couple of days. i think it was after like i think it was until i was like 47 that somebody said hey you want to go on a trip and you know take your girls take our girls and go whatever and go to like cabo or some shit whatever and they're like wait you mean like actually like go somewhere to do nothing i was like yeah he goes and i go that's when i realized oh my god i don't think i've ever done that at the age of 46, 47. Never, not once. I'm not even joking. I don't think I've ever told anybody that. I, I don't think I've ever had like taken a vacation. Well, your job was... sort of does allow for, you know, if you're on tour and you have a couple days off, but it's not like a two course, week but, chill but imagine out. going, imagine going, I don't know how to shut down for like a week. I don't know how to do that. I never knew it was, I have like an anxiety attack if I did that. I was like, wait, wait, no schedule? I can actually watch a, people, when people tell me about friends, I go, what are you up to? And I come up to the door and like, yeah, man, we just been watch a whole series of whatever. I'm like, wow, you can do that? Like you have the time for that? No, no, I, I hear you. Yeah, that's like 12 hours. It's like, come on, I, yeah. yeah. I know, but my, my point being is like, the Paul McCartney stuff is just like opportunity coming after hard work and more opportunity and like, you know, I, I had done work, got blessed to work with Rihanna for about three tours and 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 do like kind of like band leader, music director on stage at, at, at one of the two of the tours, you know, just for the tour. And it was quite an experience, big productions and dancers and, you know, just them allowing me to be the guitar player that I am and, and rock out songs like Umbrella and the biggest hits and make them heavy live. She wanted me to, same rig. I didn't like weaken anything, like go all in, make shit hard and heavy. Well, so I that think was that says something that about her that she wanted you. I think that's awesome of her that she wanted you, you know? I know, I know. I, listen, it was, I at first, when I got that call from a friend of mine, uh, Tony Bruno, who's an incredible guitar player from New York, out of New York, Tony Bruno, who was, who was her music director, calls me, goes, I know you're gonna say no, because you've never done these type of things. Extreme is extreme, and that's all I've known. And he says, but you know what? We've been looking for a guitar player to do this run, just a promo run. They sucked me in, just a little promo run to go do like the Saturday Night Lives and that sort of thing. And I'm like, wow, this sounds like fun. But I said, why me? Like, why a guitar player? He goes, there's no guitar. He goes, because that's why. Showed her some of your things, you know, like she, she really, you know, digs what you do. Like, you know, I want you to, we want you, I want you to come in. And Tony was an incredible music director and he made things hard rock and stuff like that. And, and uh, he was the genius behind it, as far as I'm concerned, you know, in, in, in making her hip live originally, you know, and, and he said, come down, just come down. He goes, no audition. I'm not going to audition you. You just, just learn three or four songs. And I'm like, no, 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 let me learn them. You know, I could be terrible because people don't realize what I said earlier. I could be coming down and playing those songs really badly like this. But he said to me, he goes, no, it's different because with Extreme, you already do a lot of funk, a lot of kind of clean stuff. You do ballads, you do acoustic, you're going to be able to do the R&B and do the, the reggae and do all that stuff because you've already implemented those things in Extreme. So he goes, it's no, you don't even mess with me. He goes, but still, I said, no, you got to audition me. So I went down and played. She came down, watched one song, was great. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because when you insert yourselves in these things, I, I try to tell other guitar players and other musicians, when you go for things that are outside your realm and outside of your comfort zone, they lead to other beautiful things. And in doing so and stretching yourself as a musician and as an artist and doing Rihanna, doing the Rihanna gig, 
let me rephrase that before I get me too out of this thing, not doing Rihanna, but doing the Rihanna gig. We, uh, all of a sudden, you know, her manager calls me after I said no more, like Rihanna. Like I said, there was another tour called the Anti-Tour and I said they wanted me to, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get back home. I gotta get back home to the mothership, to the extreme rock and roll mothership. I, I, I do, but thank you. And you know, they went on and, but then even during that, Jay Brown, her manager, who's a genius in his own right, hits me up and he goes, hey, I got something for you I want you to do. I'll never forget, I was on a tarmac. We just finished the extreme tour in Detroit and the snow was blazing down. We were the last plane trying to get out of there because I was going to Super Bowl. I was going to see, I was going to Arizona to see the Super Bowl with the Pats and the Giants, which we don't need to talk about. <laughs> but um, I'm a Jets fan anyway. But, but the so. crazy thing is, <laughs> there you go, okay. But the crazy thing is I'm sitting there and I'm like, and I'm telling him, Jay, please, I love you so much. Please don't ask me these things because I just, I need to like, I'm doing this thing. He goes, okay, all right, fine. I'm like, if you don't want to, you know, play with Paul McCartney, no, oh, wait, what, what? I was like, what did you just say? Wait, I think my schedule just opened up. What did you just say? Whoa. And he's like, and he said that to me. He goes, look, he goes, you're not, I'm, I'm not even supposed to be talking to you about this because it was a surprise performance. Nobody knew until that screen went up. So I, I was supposed to sign, he didn't, you know, he trusted me anyways, but uh, he said, Paul's going to be doing this thing with her. They did a song called Four or Five Seconds. I don't want anybody else but you in the room with them because I need somebody that he's going to, you know, admire, trust, and not and sit there because it's Paul McCartney. He's, you know, it's it's like, you know, and obviously Kanye is involved as well and Rihanna's involved, but really, you know, I want Paul to come in and go like, great, I got a player with me, a songwriter, somebody that's going to do this thing. And, uh, and I was like, oh my Lord, are you kidding me? And it, and it was like, you go to rehearsals, you know, forget, forget the performance is the performance. I'm thinking about, are you, are you trying to tell me that I'm going to be in a room with Paul McCartney for a week? You know, the Beatles fan that I am and the, the way the Beatles shaped my life and my brothers and my family and the history, you know, you got the, you got, you got the book of rock and roll and then you got the pages of rock and roll, you know, like there's people that go in the book and then the, 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 the two it's to me, it's the Beatles on this side and Zeppelin on the other side of the rock. It's like everybody else to me, for me falls in between that as far as rock and roll goes and pop and to be in the room. And it was the most incredible experience because I'm like, literally had to talk to myself and go like, okay, you're going to be in the room with Paul. Don't sup. Like, don't be a fanboy. Don't, don't, when you stare at him, you're going to see him right in front of you. Like, it's like, it's real. And he's going to be this close to you. And I'm like, okay, don't freak out. Don't do anything. Just be yourself. Act like it's no big deal. It's another day at the office. And I remember showing up to the rehearsal in a soundstage at Sony Pictures. And it was all secretive. Nobody ever had to sign shit when they came in. You couldn't, phones, nothing. And I'm there uh, and uh, we have our, 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 the rest of the band that's doing it. And the first one to show up is Paul McCartney. <laughs> Out of the three is Paul McCartney. And this dude comes in and he's got like another guy in a suit with him that's his driver. I would imagine his driver might be packing. Maybe, maybe it's a security. <laughs> I'm actually pretty sure he is. And uh, and the first thing this dude comes in, and I'm like, I'm looking across the room, and I got my guitar on. I'm like, oh fuck, it's Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney, he's right there. And I don't really get flustered by stars. I've never been. St- you know, starstruck to a point. You know, we used to watch like Beatles stuff and people used to pass out and everything. I'm like, I used to think that's ridiculous. How can anybody ever get that way about anybody? Let me tell you something. When this dude walked in, the room, the horizon started going like this a little bit. I started getting a little woozy like, whoa, okay. Now I see why people do pass out in front of certain people in their lifetime. I'm like, I got to get control of myself here. And I'm like feeling all like, this is like, I got to hold myself up on my marshal for a second. Let me see what's going on here. But the thing about Paul is he walks in, one person there, they leave him, they close the door, they go back to the car, he comes in. He walks in like a 17 year old. He's like shaking the guy, the guy, the guy that's the engineer is like, how you doing, man? How's it going? I can never, I can never ever take Paul without a bad Liverpoolian accent because it doesn't make sense. But he's like, what's going on? And then he sees me, he comes running over, he goes, Hey man, what's going on? He gives me a big hug. He goes, let's play. Let's play. I'm like, let's play. What are you, 12? What do you mean, let's play. You're Paul McCartney. You're a damn beetle. You're supposed to come in. You're supposed to go to your dressing room. They're supposed to have a big spread for you. And somebody's massaging your feet. And then we play when the, the other two bigs get here, right? Uh-uh. He's like, let's jam, man. Let's play. He wasn't even talking about playing the song. He was like, let's just 
and this tech is there waiting, puts an acoustic on him. In the first 30 seconds, I got Paul McCartney in front of me. We're both on guitars and we're just playing. And I'm like, Man. what the is happening here? This is insane. <laughs> And he's right here, like, you know, he, he just had, I can tell, he just had a coffee. That, he's right that close, you know. And um, and he's super endearing. He's super loving. But he's like a teenager still. He, he doesn't know he's Paul McCartney. He doesn't care he's Paul McCartney. And he's saying hi to everybody. And he's just like, you know, and we're playing stuff. And he's like, and, it, and, and, when, this, and then when he came to Four Friends, he goes, okay, can, can you show me the chords? Show me the chords. To f I thought he really... He wrote it with him, but he goes, but they took it, they shifted it, he did some stuff, and he goes, so here I am now teaching Paul McCartney how to play this song. <laughs> like, what is happening now? This is phase two. And he's like, okay, I got it, I got it right there, right? You know, like, yeah, and you can play it like this. And I'm like, okay, yeah. And I'm like kind of, I'm sweating, but I'm not sweating. I'm just, I'm, I'm like going, okay, this is really happening. And then if that wasn't enough, of course, in comes Kanye and you know, who in his own right, in his own world, in his own, you know, celebrity comes in with quite a few people. Yeah. A little you know, different. Yeah. A little different. Very, you know, untouchable, very whatever. As a matter of fact, I think for the whole week of rehearsal, I don't think Kanye ever said hi to me. I don't, you know, it's just, I was the guitar player. So a very different, very different experience, even though, listen, I, as an artist, I know a lot of stuff has happened with Kanye a lot of stuff still happening with Kanye as an artist, man. I think he's, I know everybody agrees that recognizes, you know. Oh, he's talented. He's very he's talented. Dude. Yeah. Talented. He's a, he's a great producer, all that stuff. He's done some great stuff that I've loved and everything else. But you know what? We are who we are. And, and that's for another conversation. I don't really know him personally like that. I would never talk about, but you know, it wasn't the greatest experience. It was a little bit cold. Um, you know, that time and a few times that I did get to share the stage with him to Rihanna, it wasn't, it wasn't, the greatest stories in the world. But you know what? Everybody's got their own shit. Everybody's got their own issues. Everybody's got their own mental health to deal with. Everybody's got everything. I I am I can sit here and be all fluffy with you and smiley and tell you all the perfect stories. But you know, when I hang up with you, I got my own stuff to deal with. Everyone does. Family stuff. Everyone with. does. Everyone does. And uh and but having said that, then of course Re comes in, who's one of the most wonderful people on the planet, comes in, but she's got her posse as well, and she's got her peoples and management and everything else. And I found it really interesting that out of all, you know, here here is uh, Paul McCartney, the Beatle, you know what I mean? a Beatle, and a knight, you know, and 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 he's the most playful, and he's the most most uh, giving, and he's the most like, I don't know, just like somebody you've known. I felt like I've known my whole life, which I have, in a way. And um, we get rehearsing. We start rehearsing. I'm over here, he's right next to me, we're doing the stuff, we're running the song for five seconds, figuring it out, figuring out what we're gonna do, who's gonna do what, who's gonna do this, where the performance is gonna be, it's a surprise, nobody knows, they come back from a commercial, ladies and gentlemen, boom, the thing comes up and it's the three, three amigos, they come out and boom, and then I'm next to them, I walk out a few seconds afterwards, we got a keyboard B3 player, we got our drummer and our bass player, all is good, all is good in the hood. There's some stuff that I don't want to get into was very negative on the kind of stuff, but it's not even worth it on the performance, stuff like that. There's some stuff. Because really what matters is why you asked me the story. Once it's all said and done, and we've rehearsed this thing for three or four days, it's the last day. Everybody's finishing up. And I thought we would ran it the last time. And they wanted to do a quick powwow with the three principals, Rihanna, Kanye, and Paul for a meeting. So I'm just like, I'm back with my tech and I'm saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is what I'm going to play. It was a different guitar I was playing. I was even playing an octave pedal on something because they wanted me to do Paul McCartney's bass runs, which was insane on this, whatever. It, it just all gets crazy and better. So then like every musician on the planet does, every writer back in the day was our little micro cassettes that we had, that we carried. I carried like five of them with me. So the battery wouldn't die because I was, that's how I wrote songs. I would sing a melody on the toilet, on an airplane, on my bike, on whatever it is. They all came at those points where I'd be like, all right, you know, someone said, get pizza, da, 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 da. okay, great. I get this riff. It's rest in peace. Got it there. Go. And then we'd have to go find it an hour. Go find something because it was in a cassette. Oh, Nowadays, yeah, yeah. we got this, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Voice notes. Incredible, too. So all of a sudden, I started just playing a clean sound that I needed, and this, this idea came. And they're like a mile away from me. I got my back to them in front of my Marshall. I'm playing these chords that, wow, this is really interesting. Four chords. And I'm playing a rhythm. 
And I wanted to record it. I pulled my phone out. I put it on my Marshall, but my Marshall was vibrating. The phone was falling off. So I'm like, oh, I had a, I had a, I had a suit coat on. Let me put it in here facing out while I record. So I'm going down and I'm doing this thing. All of a sudden I hear from behind, I go, what's that you playing? <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, I'm like, oh, and then I said something like, oh, sorry. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I, I like it. I like it. What do we, he goes, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's just something I'm, I'm working on. It's just a, a verse thing. He goes, he goes, what do you got for the chorus? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. Am I about to like write something with Paul McCartney? Like, really? Is this really happening? And this guy, so I'm like, I get confident, maybe a little too confident. He goes, what do you got for the course? And I go, well, I was thinking this, but what, what do you got for the course? And I'm trying to like draw him in. I'm trying to, he goes, he goes, well, do you know those chords are kind of expensive? The verse chords are expensive that you're doing there. Maybe we can simplify. And I'm like, great. So I start playing this other part and he starts singing this falsetto thing, man. In my heart, he starts singing. He's doing something like this melody. And I'm just like, I'm like, just, just, just don't fall apart. Just don't fall apart. This is insanity. This is crazy. This is, you're not dreaming. It's really happening. It's just organic. Just go with it. And then I know that this thing would have gone on for another half hour, 20 minutes, who knows. But then we got interrupted by Kanye because he saw what we were doing and he literally came over and grabbed the mic. We were done. And he says, let's run this one more time. And everybody's like, what? Like people were already out the door. It was almost like this weird thing that he saw Paul writing with me and it was really bizarre. I might be just reading into this, but we were done. It was official. And um, and it really bummed me out. <laughs> yeah. Because I was in the midst of writing possibly, who knows? I don't know. Write a song together, do a right. song together. Because I had a conversation with Paul the day before where I said, hey, man, I go, I know, I know you were, um, I know that you don't write with a lot of people. You don't collaborate with many people. From what I can remember, Michael Jackson, Elvis Costello, maybe that's it. John Lennon. You know, <laughs> But the, my, my my point taken outside of the Beatles. Yeah, and he he says to me, he goes, "Well, you know, we don't. I just don't. Uh, you know, you know. Ever since John, you know, is gone, like I don't really had that relationship with anyone. And I was just sitting there, and he was talking. You know, he said a few things about John, and I was just like, wow. And uh, and I could see that sort of like that sadness when he was saying that that miss missing to collaborate. With of course, I was going to go like, hey. I'm right here if you yeah. need me. You know, we're doing it now. But of course, that was the day before. And, and and he said, you know, and then when they hit me up for this, I thought, wait a second, Kanye and Rihanna, this is really interesting to me. Like I'm I'm in my 80s for God's sakes. You know, like let me let me try this. Let's see what happens. And he loved it. And it was a great song. And he did it organically and it was great. And um so then I thought, wow, I almost had a chance organically after spending four or five days with him and him hear me playing, us talking and eating together, that maybe something, I don't know, maybe we could write something together. Of course not, right? I mean, who, who the hell do I think I am? But it's, it happened organically a little bit, at least for, I don't know, five minutes, right? Fantastic, man. But what was, cool, what was cool about that moment was that we went back to playing the song. I was like, okay, I was, everybody's kind of flustered pulling their instruments back together and we finished it. We did the song and it was over. Paul was saying bye. We'll see you tomorrow. I mean, Staples Center. We're, we're doing the run through for the Grammys, which is filmed and performed at Staples Center. Two days at Staples Center, running through it with all the other artists in the audience ready to go back and forth. Boom, boom. So imagine that. You're already playing with Paul and Rihanna, and all this stuff. And then you look out in the crowd and it's it's Lionel Richie and it's everybody that's playing. It's John Mayer. It's, it, it, it's Ed Sheeran, who, who I want to meet who I think is one of the one of our new greatest songwriters of all time, who I go to his music director, who I know, and I say, hey, can you introduce me to Ed? And then he goes to him and he says, introduce you to Ed. Ed just asked me to introduce you to you. I'm like, what? He goes, and I go, and he brings him over. He goes, he goes, you know, man, this is an honor. I'm like, yeah, no, the honor is mine. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, you don't understand. He goes, do you know that the first song I wanted to learn, I brought to my guitar teacher was one of yours. And of course I go to Ed and I think more than words. Okay, here's the more than words story. 
He goes, no, no, no. He goes, I'm sure you think it's more than words. He goes, I go, of course it is. He goes, no, no, no. Cupid's dead. And I was like, what? I said, you, guitar, Cupid's dead? All that riff around that crazy, insane. He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I go, I'm not buying it. He goes, oh, yeah? Come with me. Brings me onto the stage, grabs John Mayer's guitar, who he's performing with, and and starts playing. Or maybe it was his guitar, but John Mayer's up there. He's like, and he, and he starts playing he starts playing the riffs and I'm like literally I, it's on my it's on my Instagram from a hundred years ago of me I have to get this you mind if I get this he goes and he starts playing he doesn't remember a lot of it but he's given it a, a good go my head was like this is the world that I'm living in this is why I'm telling you why I'm so blessed in the world that I'm living in with a bunch of heroes there and you know Andy Gibb and all these people that are there like that I'm talking to them and I'm in the company of them and it's just the blessings that I've gotten from doing all the things that I'm doing. But back, you know, meanwhile, back at the Paul McCartney ranch, we finish. Paul comes over, uh, saying bye to everybody as they're leaving, we're going. So I turn around. And the first thing I wanted to do, I'm the youngest of 10 kids. My oldest brother, Robert, he's the oldest. He, he Biggest Beatles fan. He's the one that brought the Beatles into the house. He used to play in an army base in Portugal for all the American soldiers and everything else, playing all Beatles stuff with a band called Sombers, which is Shadows. And all they played was uh, that stuff. And he had just seen Paul. It's his God. It's it's that's my God. It's it's my family's God. You know, Beatles. Paul. He just seen him at Fenway Park. So I know I'm not supposed to tell anybody. I'm like that. I'm not telling anybody. I got to tell Robert. He's not going to believe it. He's the one. I owe this to him. So. I'm like, I'm going to, everybody's gone. I'm going to go and grab my phone. I'm going to call my brother Robert and tell him, hey, you know, I'm calling. So, of course, I'm looking for my phone. I can't find my phone. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, where's my phone? Where's my phone? You answer that question. Where is your phone? It's in my pocket. Oh, my God. What, <laughs> what, was, my, what was my phone doing when he came over? Recording. Recording what I was doing. You got the whole thing? So, you don't think I have a voice note that says Paul and I, where I can hear him singing that falsetto part? That's like 5,000 me? megabytes long? <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's 5,000 megabytes. No, no, it was short. Oh, okay. And the first thing I did was I emailed it, texted it to myself 12 times and whatever in case I have it. Just, just so to make it, sure. Didn't listen, just didn't even listen to it. for. I couldn't even listen to it for a long time because I couldn't even believe like I was just whatever. But my point being is, it even gets better than that for me. I have this little thing. Of course, I'm not going to release it or put no, it no, out no. or do whatever. But I have this little thing, this little voice note for a memory. And I'm about to hit my brother up and tell him I'm even more excited now because that happened. And I say to myself, I dial his number. I'm like, no, no, screw that. I need to see my brother Robert's face when I tell him what I'm doing right now and tomorrow. So I FaceTime him. So I, I'm facing this way and I'm FaceTiming him. And he's like, hey, how's it going? What's up? And I go, Robert. You're not gonna believe where I am right now. He's like, oh yeah? And as I'm saying that, who walks by 10 feet away from me is Paul McCartney. He came back in and I'm not supposed to be doing this for nobody. I, there's, we wrote, we put something, they only let me have my phone because I was her music. They're like, I'm close to Re and all that stuff. They don't, they're not gonna deal with me like that. Like, like, you know. So I'm like, Robert, I turn away, I'm like, hey, sorry, I can't talk to you right now. I, I'm not supposed to be talking to you, Rob. And Paul's, I didn't say anything to him, but I see Paul talking to his tech. Right? So I turn around again and I hear the voice again behind me. Who's, who are you talking to? <laughs> and I said, oh, it's my brother, Robert. He's a you know big fan or whatever. This dude, Paul McCartney could have just either been A, upset that I was FaceTiming anybody. B, just said, okay, talk to you later. Or C, be the true Paul McCartney and he goes and he grabs the damn phone and he puts his arm around me and he grabs the phone and you imagine the look on my brother's face when I didn't tell him anything and he sees his little brother the youngest and the oldest paying it talk about a payback and and Paul says to him hey Robert I'm here with your little brother how are you doing Robert and my brother's face was just like and I said to my brother, say hi to Paul. Say hi to Paul. You're not saying anything. <laughs> he was in shock. And what a beautiful thing. For that is guy so great. Know. I mean, a guy at that level does not need to do any of that. No. Period. You got one guy who didn't say hi to me for two weeks, and you got a guy who's talking to my family. And given that gift back to my brother who really wouldn't, I probably would have never known the Beatles like I know the Beatles if it wasn't for him. Talk right. about a full circle moment with your oldest from your youngest 
giving a gift back. And then him going, yeah, I'm playing with your little brother. He's doing good. He's doing all right. He's doing <laughs> like, I love that he said like, little brother, know. you know, little brother. That's so yeah. great. Yeah. And, and, and he said, uh, and he said, all right, man, take care. And I go, sorry, Robert, got to go. Boom, hung up. Because Fantastic. I had to, now I had to like walk back out. And, you know, and then my family all blew up my phone saying, I think your brother's in the hospital. He's having a heart attack. I go, don't worry about him. If he dies today, he just saw. It's all just good. Saw his God, God, God at the gates of heaven. He's all good. But that was, that was a story. Of course, I listened to that voice note. I have it. It's not the greatest recording in the world because it's in my jacket. Right. Yeah. My guitar's like, but I can hear him just a little bit and I can hear it. And I have that little. A little gift, you know. Fantastic. Nuno Betancourt is with us. The new album from Extreme is six. Everyone go out and get it. They're playing Bergen Pack uh, January 24th in Englewood, so definitely go check that out. Uh, if you can get tickets, it's probably sold out, but we don't know that. But try anyway and get all the info. Do it, do it. I'm, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm telling you right now, if there's one thing that Extreme, you might, you know, if you've never seen the band, you know, I've been asking people, after three or four songs every night from Europe to UK, everywhere I go, how many people here have not seen the band? I'm thinking it's going to be maybe 5%, maybe 10, you know, it's going to be hard. It's been in the 50, 60, 70% realm sometimes. A lot of new fans, young fans. So I'm telling you right now, Extreme is better live right now than they were back in the day. I promise you that. You'll get a great show. It'll we're going to go show. check it out for sure and get all the info, all the tour dates, the the all the great new videos of the band at extreme-band.com. Nuno, uh, thank you so much for spending and, and giving us so much time. Um, I've been a fan forever. I continue to be. I will see you at uh, Bergen Pack in Englewood on January 24th. Dude, I'm excited. Make sure you say hello. I got one question for you. Yeah. What happened to the purple blue guitar? Oh, it's in storage. <laughs> it's in storage because I just okay. moved. Oh, I That's still awesome. have it. Please, I'm not letting that go. Come on, it's got oh, your bring, autograph bring that, on bring, it. Bring, it's got your autograph on, on it. I'll, I'll sign it. We'll yeah, sign yeah, maybe. It. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. You get the whole bit. if you can dig it out of storage. I have stuff in storage that I could probably never find, but yeah. S uh, storage wars. That's what I'm going through. Our Oregon pack, man. Yeah, make sure you say hi, man. I definitely right, will. See you soon. Thank you, man. Take all care. Right, this is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043.